everybody, welcome back to Find My Past from Home. My name is Ellie, I'm Senior Community Executive at Find My Past. And this is, this is Friday's Live. This is the chance for us to sit back, relax, talk about all things family history, all things genealogy, and it's a time for you guys to connect. It's a time for us to connect with you, you to connect with us. It's my favourite time of the week. It's lovely to see you. I hope you've all had a, a good week and a good Friday and that you're looking forward to the weekend. Hopefully some cosy family history time where you can just turn off everything else and just relax with some family history and explore your family tree and tease out any stories that are waiting to be found this week. Uh, so please say hello in the comments. Let's welcome those of you who are joining already, because there are some of you, which is lovely. Let's have a look and see who we've got. We've got Nicole, hello. We've got Roz, Karen. Oh, I should say as well, Alex is in the comments, so please say hello to him. He's feeling a little bit worse for wear, so maybe you could you know, send him your good wishes. We've got William who says, uh, hello from a surprise, from surprisingly good weather in Cumbria, had three days of monsoon season a few days ago. Do you know, I nipped out over lunch to get something to eat and it was just a torrent of rain here in Edinburgh, but it was quite nice because it's quite mild today, which is good. So that's my weather report for here in Edinburgh. Please share where you are, where you're from, where you're tuning in from today and what your week's been like and things like that. Uh, we've got Robin joining us from Toronto. We've got Sally saying, yay, happy Friday. Yes, happy Friday. Oh, honestly, it's my favorite time of the week. We've got Roxanne joining from a very chilly Utah. I'm really hoping to visit Utah again soon. I went to, I was very fortunate to go to Roots Tech in 2019 as part of Farmer Past. And I'm hoping to be able to go again at some point. It was a really good trip. Uh, who else have we got here? We've got Valerie joining us, if I can find her comment. Happy Thanksgiving to Canada. Happy Thanksgiving indeed. Uh, can't wait to feast here in Ohio. Lovely. Um, we've got Graham as well and Margaret from Chester. I know Chester very well. It's very close to my heart. I grew up in, in North Wales and I, I spend a lot of time in, in Chester. Fantastic. Lots of you here. That's fantastic. Um, did you know that Who Do You Think You Are is starting in the UK again next week? I'm really excited. That's all I'm going to say because I've seen the first episode already and it's brilliant. And I can't spoil anything, but it is so good. It's with Josh Widdicombe, the comedian. I'm really excited for everybody to watch it. So in terms of what we're going to do today, we're going to look at our new records that we've added to Find My Past this week, because we do add new records to Find My Past every single week and new newspapers. And it means that every single week you have a chance to break another wall, find a new ancestor or add a new node to your family tree and maybe even find a story that makes you laugh, makes you cry, makes you think, what were they thinking, et cetera, et cetera. But that's what family history is all about. It's all about the stories. Yes. I'm going to coin that phrase. And what I really want to, to touch on as well is you'll notice that the question of the week this week is for you to tell me about your current, a current brick wall that is giving you some trouble. And there is a reason for this. There's a method in my madness. I've had loads through already. So thank you for those. And what I've done is I've put them onto some slides that we'll look at a little bit later. Keep sharing your brick walls. But what I would say is and I don't want to spoil anything because we'll touch on this in a bit. Keep your, uh, your query, your brick wall concise, give as, but give as much important detail as you can. Give names, locations and rough dates if you can. Yes, this is important, but yes. And something else we're going to look at a bit later on is Alex last week looked at sort of the history of spies. And I'm going to build on that this week and talk a little bit about some real life spies that I found in the 1939 register. I fell, fell down a huge rabbit hole looking at this. I found it utterly fascinating. I always find things fascinating when I research them for Friday's Live. And so I'm going to share some of the stories that I found in there and hopefully inspire you to use family history records in a way that you might not actually expect. You might not think, oh, 
I could use the 1911 census for this. You might not actually be interested in it, but just in case, I think. And just to show you the sort of things you can actually find if you go looking for them. Now, Alex also needs your help as well. So he's actually looking for some people who have a story about their homes or house they used to live in that has a spooky story behind it. Now, perhaps you've gone and researched why there might be a ghost or might be spooky goings on and things like that. So he's looking for some help. And the plan is it might, it might, it might appear in the press. So if you do have anything like that, please email your discoveries to us at discoveries at findmypast.com. And if Alex thinks, yes, that's a really good one, he'll be in touch. And hopefully Alex will be happy now that I have, I've shared that. Lovely. And as I said, if you haven't got question of the week in yet, it is I want to hear about a brick wall that currently has you completely stumped. And again, be concise be detailed and give things like names, locations and dates if you can. Okay, lovely. Okay, and lastly, before I kick off, um, please share this stream with your friends so they can see it too and more people can join our lovely community. So before we do new records, let me just go back to the comments ever so slightly. Miko talking about some, he's talking about spooky stuff as well. Let me get rid of that banner. There we go. Um, let's have a flick through. Yes, more questions of the week coming in. Good, keep them coming. We will touch, touch on those a little bit later, which is fantastic. Yes, lots. And we've got, yeah, we've got Daphne here as well. We've got Louise. Victoria. Are you not very well, Victoria? Hope you feel better. Hope all is okay. Uh, we've got Mark tuning from sunny Cornwall. We've got Becky from Pittsford in Pennsylvania. Uh, Jen from Denver. The air is almost clear enough to see the mountains. Lovely. Have to get some pictures done, won't you? Brilliant. Lots of you here. This is great. Uh, Warren, uh, Paul, excuse me, joining us from Warrington. Lovely. Okay, right. Let's do some new records. Uh, so there's a couple to go through this week, and then we've got newspapers to go through as well, which is really exciting. So the first new record collection we've got this week is the Edinburgh Apprentices for 1583 to 1800. Now, there were informal apprenticeships or in, uh, and, uh, and indentures, but sometimes these, they weren't often recorded, so you might not find these in the records. And in case you don't know, if you were an apprentice, you would rely on your master for various things. So food, shelter, uh, clothing sometimes. And then the apprentices often had, they had certain restrictions, okay? So they couldn't, they might not be able to marry while they were an apprentice, they might not be able to gamble, they might not be able to visit public houses even while they were an apprentice. And then once you've sort of completed your apprenticeship, the idea would be that you could join a guild or a burgess and make, so just make sure to cross-reference those records as well, and then maybe even the newspapers, there may be some details in there too. So for these Edinburgh Apprentice records, you can often get, in fact, most of the time, you get the name of the apprentice, you get the apprentice father's name, you get the name of the master, you get dates, you, you normally get the residence of the father as well, the, the apprentice's father, the trade, and then there's also additional notes. So in particular, for some of the ones I was exploring, I saw that it would note the residence of the master. It might denote that the apprentice's father had passed away. So definitely check the notes column as well. And you don't, you, how do I phrase this? You can search by the apprentice's name, but you can also search by the master's name. And when you're searching, you actually have the option to search by all of them or search by just apprentice or just master, which will really, really help. I went and then had a look to see what I could find for you to show you some examples. And I looked at swans in Edinburgh during this time because I have swan in my family tree, although they are based over in Dumfrieshire. Anywho. 
So I found an Alexander Swan and the record, this one record told me that he was the son of John Swan, who, and he became apprentice to a Skinner um, called William Whiteman in 1701. And it also tells me that John Swan, the father, is deceased and that William is the, apparently the deacon of Skinners. I didn't even know that was a thing. And then I found another one in 1732. There's another Alexander Swan as a master merchant. It could be the same guy. It, it might not be. Um, taking on a John Graham, son of William Graham. And by this point, this particular Alexander is a Burgess, according to the notes. So, yeah, go and check those out if you've got Edinburgh ancestors and let us know what you find, as always. So in terms of the, the new news, uh, what, no, I've skipped. Why have I skipped my newspapers? No, I haven't skipped my newspapers. I wanted to talk about the overseas births and deaths. Um, these are these are really, really good, actually. We've added, I think, I can't remember the exact number, but we've added more records into this existing collection. So if you have ancestors who were British, um, but they were born or they died overseas, then you should find them in these records. So go and check those out. Really, really good for traveling ancestors. Anybody who might have served overseas in the military, for example, go and check those out. Yes, that's the next one. Now I can move on to newspapers. So the big headline newspaper this week, its brand new title is The Keys. And this was a journal and it was published between 1933 and 1939 by the League of Coloured Peoples. And I say, when I say coloured peoples, this was the language they used. It's something to it's something important to remember when you're looking at a, a, a newspaper or a journal like this. It can use outmoded or outdated language. So just something to bear in mind. So the League was actually founded two years previously by Dr. Harold Moody. He came from Jamaica to Britain, I think in 1904, to become a doctor. And what he found is that he he was in, became increasingly upset and frustrated at the levels of racism that people experienced. So the League was founded in order to improve relations between the races. That's actually what it says in the first edition. So, as I said, it's important to know about the language. What's really good is that we get glimpses into what life was like for black people in Britain in the 1930s, especially when fascism was on the rise. I actually, I mentioned this on Wednesday, I watched a really, really interesting documentary on, I think it was BBC Four, about Scotland's involvement in the slave trade. And one of my key takeaways from that, you know, it was very hard to watch. One of the things I took away from that was slavery, it took a lot of things away from people. It robbed them of, of a lot of things, but in particular, their history. And I just think, what, what, what must it be like going to an archive and trying to find out things about your history and your family's history and there being nothing there, nothing at all. So that's why it's really important for us to preserve publications like this and documents like this. And in particular, The Keys is free to view on Family Past and also the British Newspaper Archive, in addition to several other diverse titles that we've made free as well. And if you missed it, go back and have a look at our interview of S.I. Martin. He's an author and historian, and he went into sort of the thinking and the context behind the keys, how it came about and why it was needed. So that's the big title that we've added this week. We've also got exist um, existing titles have been updated with some new pages. So there are over 40,000 pages into the London Evening Standard. So that now spans 1871 to 1914. And did you know, because I did not, that the London Evening Standard was apparently banned in Germany and Italy during the Second World War? Apparently, they didn't like some of the cartoons it featured of certain fascist leaders. There you go. More pages have also been added to the Daily News for London. And did you know, because again, this is something I did not know, its first editor was Charles Dickens. There you go. More pages into the Faversham News for Kent. Lots more years with the latest being 80, no, excuse me, 1980. I'm getting my numbers mixed up. 
1925 and 1927 have been added for the Cornish Post and Mining News, some World War II years for the Lynn News and County Press, and there was a news, another newspaper as well, but I have forgotten the name of it. So yes, those are the new records and the new newspapers. So lots for you to explore this weekend. Let us know what you find. And yes, lovely. So I'm just going to bring up the question of the week banner again. There we go. I'm going to go back to the comments and have a look and see what else we've got through here. Yes, births and baptisms, fantastic. Thank you, Alex, for those links. Lots of questions of the week. Miko saying as well, the biggest collection of guild records online and even includes photos of the individuals in some cases. Woohoo, fantastic. Lots coming in here. Lovely. Okay. So the reason we're doing this particular question of the week will be revealed in a moment. Um, but I'm just going to share my screen just so you can see. Okay. Hopefully you can see that. Okay. So what I've just done is I've pulled together the first initial answers I had for question of the week because I tried to put them onto banners in this and they wouldn't fit. So I put them onto slides instead. And I want to make sure that you can see them and not just hear me read them out. So let's have a look here. And what I would recommend is, this is not, this is not homework as such. While I'm going through these, either on your on a piece of paper have a note down any of these you think you might be able to help with you might something that you know that maybe the person who has submitted this maybe doesn't and you think oh they should really go and try this make a little note of it for me whether it's on a piece of paper or on your phone or on your tablet etc or on your laptop just make a little note while we go through these. So these were some really, really good brick walls. I'm just gonna quickly run through these, if it'll work. But before I do, what indeed is a brick wall? Because if you are joining us for the first time, maybe you're not a family historian and you're not sure, or you, maybe you've just not even heard the term before. I like to think a brick of a brick wall as a genealogy problem that you're struggling to solve or a family tree conundrum, something that doesn't quite make sense, for example. And quite often I find that brick walls mean that you can't move any further back. So that maybe there's a missing piece of evidence, there's something that doesn't exist, hasn't been digitized, been destroyed, there's, um, it's been recorded differently to how you might expect, which means it's really, really difficult to find. All of these could contribute to brick wall, and I'm sure you all have your, your own definition for what a brick wall is, how it makes you feel, etc. But I think that's one of the, the great things about family history is it's it's a puzzle a lot of the time and it's a bit like detective work. So if we didn't have these brick walls from time to time, I don't know, would the fun go out of it a little bit? I think perhaps so, because again, one of the great things about family history is there's always there's always new records being added to family past and other websites. And yeah, there's always more that is allowed to be public, if that makes sense. Like, for example, with baptism records, for example. So there's a hundred year rule on those, things like that. Um, Roxanne, it's something that you can't, let's have a look, something you can't, can't your head against until you go mad. Yes, quite. Um, oh no, I'm skipping ahead. And you might be wondering, how on earth can I break down my brick wall? So I've got a genealogy problem. What on earth do I do with it? So this is just some very, very basic advice that I would strongly recommend trying. Keep checking the new records, wherever they may be. Reassess the evidence that you've got look for gaps. So if you've got a timeline for a particular ancestor and you can pinpoint this happened here and here is the evidence, this happened here and here is the evidence, but then you've got a gap in between where there's a lack of evidence, for example, 
make sure that you've got those gaps highlighted and then you can always go back in and refill on that timeline when you find something new and things just might drop into place a little bit the, the penny might drop so to speak check the originals we t we say this all all the time at Find My Pass. if there is an original image attached to the transcript check it because chances are there's more detail there yeah, there's not really much else to say on that, just that I would definitely advise doing it. Ask experts. There's so many experts around, you know, a lot of them are on Twitter, actually. So maybe go and go and ask them for advice. There's also, you know, blogs and things like that, not just from us, from, but from other organisations like the National Archives have a fantastic collection of research guides. Definitely recommend those. There are more. There's lots of guides out there basically and you know a lot of genealogists and family historians do q and a's every now and then as well so like miko for example he does a, a monthly q and a with us which is always really really popular and it means you can connect with an expert really really easily and then finally i think the last one for me is to ask the community because it's not just the experts that have got the knowledge and the know-how it's everybody else, it's all of you, okay? I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but this is the point behind this little exercise. So let's have a quick read through these. So Sally's brick wall is for a chap called Douglas Guy. And Sally says he was born in 1881 in Portsmouth into a family of tailors, served in South Africa during the Boer War. And on his return, he lived in Oxford with his family. He left the UK to go to Australia in January 1907. Luckily, we have postcard evidence of his arrival in Sandstone. He wrote home several times, and then in about 1908, the trail stops. I've not been able to find anything more about him in Australia or even in New Zealand. I've searched death records from William Graves, the newspapers, marriage records, you name it, I feel I have looked. Douglas Guy is my big old brick wall. So remember what I said, if you have any advice for Sally or a record collection that you think she should try, make a quick note of it. Okay, all right, next one. So Diane's brick wall, I should just point out, by the way, these photos, these images that I've added, um, I've just added these, these are not from the community members in question. <laughs> I just wanted the, the slides to look a little bit more interesting. So. Diane's brick wall. My husband's second time's great grandparents emigrated from Ireland, but I don't know where from where in Ireland. John J. Walsh, born February 1849, immigrated to New York City in 1868. Ellen Fox, born March 1849, emigrated to New York City in 1867. Were they married? No, excuse me. They were married in New York City in 1870. I don't know if they knew each other in Ireland or if they met in New York. So where were they from? That is the question there. Oh, I see. I saw Sally in the comments there. Fantastic. Uh, Tracy says, uh, my brick wall is my husband's, my husband Brian's four times great grandfather, Char, Char, I don't know what's going on with me today. I apologise. Christopher Barkin, born between 1810 and 1815 in West Briggs, which is now part of Tottenhill in Norfolk. I have his full history from censuses, but just cannot find his baptism record to determine his parentage. On the censuses, his year of birth varies from 1811 to 1819. The latter is obviously wrong, as it would only make him 12 years old when his first child, Sarah, was born in 1831. Even his marriage certificate has no information. And I know it's not the Christopher Barkham born in 1805, as he dies in Lincolnshire in 1856, whereas Hubby's Christopher dies in Birmingham in 1890. I've tried all the baptism records within five miles of where he was born. So we're after a baptism there for Christopher Barkin. Make a note if you think you can help with this one. Then we move on to Elaine. So Elaine says, my four times great grandfather, Andrew Charles, is a mysterious one. It states he was the master's mate of the Hebe. The Hebe? I probably pronounced that wrong on his marriage certificate to Mary Matthews in 1794. However, he doesn't appear on any of the logs in the National Archives under this vessel. He also apparently is Swedish and signs his name in the manor, in the manor or his country? 
I think I'm misreading that. But the, for the life of me, I cannot find any more information on him. And I would love to know more. So we've got a little bit of a, a stop gap there for Andrew Charles. We can't go any further back. So if you've got any advice for Elaine, make a note. And then we move on to Kim. So Kim says, my great grandfather's girlfriend, Mary Ann Fusher disappeared in 1910, age 25, after she was remanded for stealing his watch. Oh, this is a good one, Kim. She does not appear in the 1911 census, and if she was still alive by the 1939 register, then she doesn't show. She never had contact again with her son after she vanished. He was born in 1908 and was brought up by his father. Wow. Okay, so any ones for that one? Make a note, any advice? Then we've got, I think this is, yes, I've got Fiona, is that right? Yes, I'm losing track of how many I've got here. Fiona's brick wall says, my paternal grandfather's mo mother, Lily Partridge, I know nothing about her except she was probably a kitchen maid in the home of the local police chief. Um, she had my grandfather out of wedlock and gave, gave him the middle name Warrington, which just happened to be the family name of the police chief. Interesting. He was brought up by a family friend called Granny Rachel and his mother Lily seemed to vanish off the face of the earth. I would love to know more about her, but I don't know where else to search. So who we're after here is Lily Partridge. Where did she come from? And you know, where was she born? Things like that. And then we've got Graham. Uh, Graham says, my brick wall is getting on for four years. Keep chipping away at it. And then I move on to another part of the family. I think that this is what I do with brick walls as well, actually. I keep going back to them. So Graham says, I'm trying to prove who my great great grandfather is. My great great grandfather was Timothy Roberts, 1770 to 1853, who married Anne Lee in Worthenbury, Flintshire in 1794. They had 12 children between 1795 and 1816. Two of the children were both named Thomas, born 1798 and 1816. Thomas was my great great grandfather. The correct great-great-grandmother was Mary Price and married in either 1827 or 1828, of which they had five children, one of which was my great-grandfather. The problem is, which Thomas? The results tend to show Thomas 1816, but then that would make him about 13 when he married, which obviously doesn't make sense. And for the other Thomas, I cannot find any details. So the brick wall is, who is my great-great-grandfather? So we've got two people two separate Thomases that could be Graham's great-great-grandfather. Make a note if you can help with that one. Right, have I got any? I think I've got one more here. I think that's, yes, that's the last one. Um, so Steve's brick wall, I have been trying to find my three times great-grandfather's place of birth for many years, but with no luck. Thomas Provost, born 1795 and died 1872 in Preston, Lancashire. The early, earliest record I have for him is his marriage in 1821 in Knaresborough to Jane Robinson, who was born in 1799 and died in 1845 in Preston. Both of that parish. There are no other provosts in the area. I've been unable to link him to the, any of the other provost families in the country. Help. Okay, that's all the brick walls. I'm going to get rid of that. There we go. What we're going to do is change. There we go. Um, so why have I asked for your brick walls today? And I would love to say that I've gone away and I have solved them all for you. I haven't, I'm afraid. I like, I'm, I'm calling this a brick wall swap because one of the great things about our family history community as a whole is that we don't have to do family history on our own. I think there's often the, the conception that genealogy is a solitary hobby because you know we, we, we sit at our, our computers or we sit in libraries or archives and normally we are on our own. Sometimes we obviously go to you know, family history society meetings and things like that or talks at various archives, but it's otherwise it's quite solitary until you get to the community. So this brick wall swap, I challenge you over the course of the next week, if you have put in a brick wall on either this video or the promotional post that went up yesterday, 
If you've put one in for yourself, I challenge you to choose one other person's brick wall and have a stab at it. See what you can find. I'm not expecting you to solve one. If you do, that's brilliant. Well done. Pat on the back. Offer some advice. You can pick a random one or you can pick one that is your, maybe you know the area really well or you know census records back to front, that sort of thing. Have a go. Comment back on that person's reply to that person's comments and just let them know what you found. So just to recap, if you've added a brick wall today in the comments on this video or on the promotional post, which I've taken these from, so you'll have to go back to the promotional post to find the ones I've just read out, pick one and have a go and let that person know how you got on. How does that sound? Lots of fun. So yes, this is why I was asking for you to be concise but detailed and add things like names, locations and years if you know them. And what's really interesting is that when I was planning this out and I put the post up reminding you of today's Friday's Live, some of you already started putting your brick walls up and there were some of you who were already going in to offer your advice and that is just what I... Yeah, fantastic. This community is lovely and I, I can't I can't get over how amazing you all are. And remember as well, if you do want to swap brick walls or tips or anything like that, we've got the Find My Pass forum as well, which is our official Facebook group. Remember to answer the membership question if you do request to join and it's run by the community for the community. Um, yeah, go and have a look. Uh, it's uh, It's good fun. And we can swap knowledge and things like that. And we can all learn from each other. Now, I'm just going to flick back to the comments. And I just want to read out some of these live ones for these live questions of the week. So Gillian says, my brick wall is my great grandfather, Henry Finley. I know he was born an Irish Catholic and moved to Glasgow at some point in the 1890s and married my great grandmother, Agnes. He was her second husband. On the 1901 and 1911 Scotland census, it doesn't say where in Ireland he was born. Oh, it's so frustrating when that happens. Uh, from what I learned from one of my cousins a while back, he was shunned by his family when he married Agnes because he was Catholic and she was Protestant. So we want to know, if anybody thinks that they can help Gillian with this one, we want to know where in Ireland this particular Henry Findlay was from. Uh, lots of you saying this is a good idea. I hope so. I think you guys do this anyway. You guys help each other out all the time. Um, I see it. Alex sees it. Nico sees it. Jen sees it. Yeah. Um, yes, Linda just asking where I can, can I find the promotional posts? Um, so, Alex, if you could just share the links to the Facebook posts for me. Uh, just so we've got cross-reference because obviously we're streaming on YouTube and on Facebook. Fantastic. Right, I'm just going to scroll up and see what else we've got here. So uh, Debbie is after great-grandfather David Myers, born 1814 in Hull, England. Can't find any ancestors for him. So yeah, ideally what we need there is a, is a baptism record or clues on things like his marriage record or any later census records that might tell us. Lovely. Yes, Rosie. Yes, you you were one of the ones I um I noticed already answering brick walls, and you are fantastic. So thank you so much. Um, asking if Kim is watching. Did you follow up on Sarah and Fuchsia? Interesting. I can't wait to see what might come back off this. We might we might have lots of brick walls broken down this weekend, and I'm so excited for that. Uh, Jackie saying a whole family of my relatives go missing between the 1851 and 1861 censuses. Samuel Campbell, born 1791, in, I can't pronounce that, uh, with his wife Grace, possibly Dixon. I've got Scottish Dixons in my family tree, actually. Um, born 1793. Children Samuel, William, Robert and John, uh, Jane and Walter. No sign of them from 1851 onwards in BMD census immigration records. So if anybody's got any suggestions for Jackie there, what happens to this family? Because they just seem to disappear. Lovely. Okay, 
Um, okay, I'm just going to scroll up and see what else we can find here. Uh, Matt says, I think many brick walls are broken when people migrate and there aren't any records. No, sorry. There are brick walls where people migrate and there aren't any records to show the potential same people are the same people. So within Ireland or from in Ireland to England. Yeah, that's a really valid point, actually. Sometimes the records just weren't kept. And I think it's important that then we look in the available records for clues. That is usually... That's usually a really good way of doing it. I mean, I think some that sometimes you have to have a little bit of luck and almost know what you're looking for. I've lost count the amount of times that I have been doing my family history research and I just, you know, for example, I'm looking at an original record and I see something that I'm just like, and it's what one tiny little bit of information that I wasn't looking for but it proves something else. I, I have to tell you my example. I've talked about this many, many times, but I, when I did my pharma past living DNA DNA test, it came back and said I was uh, part Scottish. And I never knew until that moment that I had Scottish relatives. I just thought I was Welsh and English. And I set it aside for a bit and didn't really do anything with it. And then at one point I was researching my great grandmother's family tree and she was born Smith. And I just thought, this is, I'm never going to find anything about her. And I was looking through census records for potential matches for her parents, I think, or her father. And I found one that said, born in Scotland. I was just like, oh, I wonder if that's him. So then I was on a wild goose chase then trying to prove if this family of Smiths were my Smiths. And then quite by accident, I was looking at the 1939 register, looking at my two times great grandparents who had moved to North Wales by that point. And I was just I was just looking at it again. I'd seen it before. And I opened up the original image and I was just exploring that. And I noticed th their address and they were living in a house called Dumfries. Why in North Wales were they living in a house called Dumfries? I, I didn't know. But that was the little bit of information that I needed to connect the dots. And then I started ordering certificates and then I proved it. I proved that that family of Smiths that I found in the census were the right ones. And now my Scottish family tree goes back hundreds of years, hundreds of years. And I'm, I'm so happy. It's one of my, it's one of my favourite family history discoveries, actually, because I now live in Scotland, having been born in North Wales, moved to Scotland five years ago, never knowing that I was actually, I actually had some Scottish roots. So that was really nice. Anyway, yes, um, I'll move on. Let's have a look here. Yes, okay, lots of comments there, that's fantastic. Let's see what else we've got here. Uh, yes, Alex saying, never underestimate the power of a wild card. Absolutely. And lots of you saying Smith is also a problematic name. Yes, it's, uh, I actually did some research from our past and I found that Smith was the most common surname in England and Wales since records like the birth records began in 1837. And then one of my other last names is Jones. Lucky me, hey? <laughs> it makes it more fun, I'm sure. I'll just keep telling myself that. Okay, right. Um, I'm just looking at the time. I've got 20 minutes. Let's see if we can squeeze in some spies shall we now has anybody seen the new james bond film no spoilers okay not having anybody being spoiled for it i did see it last week it was my birthday last week and um myself and my fiance we went to see it and enjoyed it very much but i love a good spy story like a lot so i decided to see if i could find any real life spies in our family history records. And I thought there must be some somewhere. They're probably hidden and they're probably down with different names or different occupations. You know, you're not going to come across a census record for somebody and it says occupation spy. That's just not going to happen. With hindsight, obviously, and with records in the National Archives now becoming available, we can actually see who the spies were. 
and we can look them up. And I fell down a rabbit hole on this. And I decided to look at the 1939 register for this mission. And that's because it's a great snapshot of England and Wales on the eve of war, when people are scrambling in many, many senses of the word. And one of the, the, the areas that were trying really hard to get organised with the intelligence services. So this is what I found. I've not got any slides to show you, just have unfortunately have to listen to me with my storytelling. And as usual, I'm adding for dramatic effect in terms of how I'm telling the stories. So I actually found out when I was researching this that before the war, and we're talking back into the 1920s, okay, the intelligence services were actually really keen to find out who was in Britain, but was anti-British and perhaps even fascist, okay? They wanted to pinpoint these people and monitor them, pass information back to the intelligence services and things like that, just so you, they could keep an eye on them, just in case they might present a problem. Now, one of the most famous people to be involved in this, and I think, I think they call it the fifth column. And I think this isn't just the fifth column. I think it's a, a fifth column. I think there are other ones as well. It's not just in Britain. Yeah, one of the most famous ones of these officers was a chap called Eric Roberts. And he also went by the name Jack King. And for years and years, he reported on fascists in Britain. And he passed... I think it was something like 500 files on individual people to the intelligence services. So I went and had a look to see if I could find Eric Roberts or Jack King in the 1939 register. And I did. I found him living in London as a, as a clerk for the Westminster Bank. And in fact, when I looked up when I looked him up, not on the 1939 register, but about him on the net, it did say that he kept a day job as working for the Westminster Bank. And that's where I found him. I didn't see him listed as a spy or <laughs> as a, an intelligence operative. I found him listed working for a bank with his wife. And he's a really interesting figure, actually. He was born in 1907, and he actually started working for the intelligence services back in the 1920s. So this was quite, quite, you know, interwar. Interwar? Interwar? Interwar. Yeah, really, really fascinating figure. Um, and it wasn't until 1942 that he was uh, posing as Jack King, a uh, Gestapo agent. And after the war, he ended up, living in Vienna for a bit, working for MI6. And he was posing as a British civil servant to investigate the Soviets. Really, really fascinating. But it's not just him I found. I found all of these people that are connected to each other. So then you've got Eric Roberts's boss, Victor Rothschild. He, now, he headed up this programme called The Fifth Column, apparently. And I found him living in Cambridge, which is important. I'll go, go on to that in a moment. I also found his assistant, Teresa Clay, who was a zoologist, he had pronounced, pronounced, recruited, I don't know what's going on with my brain today, I apologise, a zoologist he had recruited into the intelligence services, and she was living with her relative and friend, Richard, I can't pronounce his surname, I'm really sorry, but anyway, yes, now, Victor Rothschild was friends with some of the Cambridge Five, and I really didn't know much about the Cambridge Five until I started researching this, so I obviously then went and did a little bit of reading. Um, I would highly recommend, by the way, it's fascinating stuff. So because he was living in Cambridge at the time and because he was friends with some of the, so the later Cambridge Five, the Cambridge Spy Ring, he was actually suspected later after the war of being part of the Cambridge spy ring. And I don't think it was actually proven. Um, and then with Teresa as well, Teresa is another really, really cool figure. So she never, she was never uh, an, an MI5 officer because there were no female officers in MI5 after 
uh, a, a quite a, well, not high profile. There was a woman called Jane Archer who was dismissed, and I will go on to her a little bit more in a moment, but this meant that Teresa wasn't actually an officer. And then I actually found one of the, the main people that Eric later investigated, a woman named Marita Perigo, and I found her listed as an art restorer in the 1939 register. And then it got interesting, and I've been bombarding Alex um, with my discoveries because I just I just found them so interesting, and I know Alex finds this interesting as well. I found something I'm tentatively calling the Spy Hotel, and I want you to picture this for a moment. So, London, 29th of September, 1939, and war has just broken out, and everybody's, you know, as I said, scrambling. Scrambled, scrambling to get things organized. And, you know, one of the people, one of the organizations that's doing that is MI5. So I looked up in the 1939 register a chap called Vernon Kell. Now, he was the MI5 service chief at this time. I took a note of where he was living, and he was living at the Carnarvon Hotel in Ealing on the 29th of September 1939. He was also known as Kay, by the way. He was also the first director of the British Security Services, or MI5, who's the first one. And he was in that post for around 30 years. Uh, it was actually Winston Churchill who dismissed him in 1940. So interesting, found him, fantastic, etc. I I noticed that he was living at this hotel, the Carnarvon Hotel, and I wondered, why on earth is he at hotel? Um, I'm, I'm sure people moved around a lot at this time, maybe not unusual. So then I opened up the original image, and what did I say earlier? Always check the original image. So I went having a look at that, and obviously there's you know two or three pages worth of people living at this hotel on this particular evening. But then I started noticing some interesting things. So also at this hotel on the 29th of September, 1939, was Guy Liddell, or Liddell, who was actually, when I looked up, the director of counter-espionage. And he, he got that post in 1940 when he was promoted to the director of B Division. And funnily enough, he was actually also suspected of being um, in the Cambridge spy ring. He was actually suspected of being the fifth man. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that because I will be here all evening. <laughs> and you've got things to do. Then I found, and you remember earlier I mentioned Jane Archer. Okay, so listed as Kathleen Archer, living with her husband at this hotel, the Carnarvon Hotel in Ealing. She was the first female MI5 officer. And she, she's utterly fascinating. I desperately need either a film, a book, or a TV series about her. I think she's incredible. There might be as one might be one already, and if there is, please tell me because I want to go and I want to go and find it. So at one point, her boss was actually um, Kim Philby, who was one of the Cambridge Five, and he at one point reduced her to um, basic investigative work. That's a long word, investigative. Um, because apparently he was afraid that because she was so good, she was so good at what she did he was afraid that she would uncover him but she didn't i'm afraid um so she was actually dismissed uh from mi5 in 1940 for insubordinance and what she'd done is she had at a very i say high profile at a big meeting at burnham palace she criticized um a chap called brigadier harker and I think she must have done it quite, <laughs> sounds awful, quite forcefully, because although Liddell, who was also there, said she had a point, apparently she went too far. Anyway, she, she was dismissed, unfortunately. And after her, as I said, there were no more women in MI5 during the war. And also at this hotel, I found various other civil servants, war office staff, and I honestly wonder what on earth was going on at that hotel. Was there a, a base at the hotel? Was there, were they working out of some of the rooms? Was there an office nearby? I don't know. I have tried to find out information about it on, on the web. I have had no luck so far. 
if any of you would like to take up the mantle and see what you can find about the Carnarvon Hotel in Ealing and see if it was some secret MI5 base, I would love to hear from you, <laughs> basically. And then there's other things I found as well. So I actually discovered that there are over 5,000 people in the 1939 register with the words war office in their occupation. Another 179 have the word intelligence in their occupation. And don't remember, this is only the people who are upfront about it. You know, there are people like Eric Roberts who just list themselves as a, you know, a bank clerk. I also learned that MI5 in 1939 was based at Wormwood Scrubs Prison. And I looked up the prison and that's exactly what I found. I found not only just the prisoners, but also a load of war office people who were working there. And although this didn't obviously come up until later, you can also go and find the people who are working at Bletchley Park. I found four out of five of the Cambridge Five spiring. So yeah, I really enjoyed this and I hope you've enjoyed my whistle stop tour of spies in the 1939 register as well. I hope, hope it's been interesting for you. I would be really interested to know actually if any of your ancestors were doing something unusual in the, when you find them in the 1939 register? Were they living somewhere you wouldn't expect or were they living with somebody else or did the, their occupation change or does it just look a bit vague, I suppose? And I say the word shady, shady makes it come across as quite negative, but unusual, we'll stick with unusual. That is what I would like to know. Okay, we've got about seven minutes left. I'm going to go back into the comments before we wrap up and just see what you guys are saying. Let's have a look here. Uh, William saying, it sounds like the Foils War series. Wonder where they got their ideas from. There's a hotel used as a main point for a lot of the scenes. <gasps> this is the thing, right, William? So I went to see if I could find any other hotels that were being used in a similar sort of way, and I did. Um, I can't remember the names of them, but I found at least another two. I also found one in Bournemouth. This, The one in Bournemouth I found wasn't as unusual because it seems to be a lot of BBC people living there and um, interpreters and things like that. So yes. Lovely. Okay, I'm scrolling back up to see what else we can find. Oh, this is a good one from Beth. I have a family story about my great great aunt who worked for the census office in World War One and supposedly got an MBE for her work. Still trying to prove or disprove the story. What I know about her, the story has a good chance of being partially or fully true. I need, I, I need, if you find that, Beth, you send it to me. I want to read it, please. Thank you. Okay, okay, I'm scrolling. Yes, Alex is saying that he has been continuing with his spy research and uh, found a chap called F. E. F. Thomas. I can't read that properly with the link. Okay. Fantastic. I'm just scrolling up to see if there's anything else I need to I need to share. Okay. Yeah, I think that's it. Oh, people say happy birthday. Yes, thank you. Another trip around the sun, as they say. Okay, well, I think we'll probably leave it there for today then. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure, as always. I hope you've enjoyed this trip into spy history and also the brick walls as well. So just to recap, if you have popped a brick wall of yours into the comments here, or you've put it on the announcement post. I would like you this week over the course of the next week to go and pick somebody else's brick wall, just one, just one, and see what you can find about it. You can either pick a random one for fun, or you can pick one that you think actually, do you know what, I have a, a really good chance of helping somebody with this. And I'm not, as I said, I'm not expecting miracles because <laughs> um you know these are brick walls for a reason 
but just go and see if you can offer any advice. Maybe say, oh, have you checked this record set? Have you looked at this resource? Have you thought about doing this, such as using name variants, etc." And what I'm hoping is that hopefully everybody who has uh, put a brick wall forward today will hopefully get somebody else helping them. So we'll have a little, this is why I'm calling it a brick wall swap. And do go back to the comments and tell the person how you got on. Even if you don't find anything or you, you think that your advice won't get them very far, please still comment anyway. Because as I said, family history doesn't have to be a solitary activity. And sometimes if we if we know that there's somebody out there as well that's helping us and rooting for us to, to, to find these stories and make the discoveries, sometimes that in itself is quite powerful. And yes, we uh, yes, we're all a, we're all a community and we help each other out. So fantastic. Okay, um, what housekeeping things did I need to share before we go? So Miko is doing his QA next week. So um Get your questions at the ready for that. I'm also going to be doing another session next week on Thursday. I may pre-record this. I may not do it live. And I'm going to be looking at various resources from the National Archives and now available on Find My Pass for you to explore, just in case there are any ones that you haven't looked at yet and may actually help you with your family tree and maybe even break down a brick wall. And then Miko is going to be doing Friday's Live again um, next week as well. And I think that's it, other than if you do have a spooky house history story to share, please send it in to discoveries at findmypast.com and remember to like and share this live stream um, so we can get more people involved in our lovely community. Okay, I will leave it there. Have a good weekend, everybody. Take care of yourselves, look after yourselves, and I will catch you next week. Bye-bye.